Welcome everybody to the uh, Test of Time Award for Supercomputing 2016. My name is uh, Mike Haru. I am the, the chair of the committee that uh, oversaw this process. Uh, it's a great privilege to uh, welcome you here and to welcome Jack Dungara and Clint Whaley uh, to receive their award. Um, they wrote a paper now many years ago on the Atlas Project. Um, a paper that received many citations in the early part of its life and continues still today to receive uh, citations. The product that it represents, Atlas uh, Auto-Tuning Library for Linear Algebra, continues to be a viable uh, part of the scientific software ecosystem and uh, something that many people rely upon to obtain portable performance on uh, on computer systems that we use every day. Um, furthermore, the uh, design, the auto-tuning design of Atlas influenced a number of other people's work. And so the paper represents both the contribution as an independent product and also as an inspiration those, to those people who do research in this area. So it is my great privilege to uh, be able to give the Test of Time Award for Supercomputing 2016 uh, to Jack Dangara and Clint Whaley. Please uh, clap. George, please. <laughs> Bush moment. You, you go first. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You got to get our picture. You stand in the middle. We got a photo. It says photo, it doesn't ah, it? Photo, yes. Photo. <laughs> they leave nothing to uh, chance, as they say. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Now, hang, hang on just a second, Jack, if you don't mind. So, um, so uh, you'll see on the screen there's a bit.ly uh, uh, link. That is to the question forum for this session. So uh, we have the ability for you to type questions uh, that we will, I will be monitoring up here and that we will ask. Also, we, for the dynamic aspect of this, we would appreciate even more if you would come up to the microphone and uh, ask your questions. And so... Um, we'll have about 15 minutes of presentation from Jack and similar for Clint, and then after that, we'll open up to questions. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Mike. I'm uh, really honored uh, to be here and um, to receive this award. I'd like to um, uh, thank uh, the organizer and the committee to, uh, that overs oversaw the, uh, the awards and so on. So this is a result of some work that took place um, back in 19, um, well, 98 was when the paper was published, but before that, of course, 97. And Clint, um, Clint was a student uh, at the University of Tennessee, working on a master's degree. And uh, after he graduated, went on and uh, got a PhD at someplace else. <laughs> okay, so just you, that's right. So you graduate. <laughs> right, that's right. So okay, just as an overview of the talk, we've got three parts. Essentially, we're going to look at what happened before Atlas. In some sense, what motivated this work uh, to take place. We're going to look at um, what Atlas is all about, and then um, look at a little bit what's happened since uh, since the Atlas paper in 1998 uh, uh, took place. So really, I want to go back um, uh, back to 1974. So in 1974, there was an activity that was started to create these things that we now refer to as the level one basic linear algebra subprograms. It, um, it was a community effort that um, brought together the numerical community to identify, to standard, uh, to create a pseudo standard uh, for these basic, uh, basic operations. And they're really vector operations, things we think of as dot product norm, taking a scalar multiple of a vector, adding it to another vector. And that was led by uh, Chuck Lawson. Uh, the co-authors are uh, Dick Hansen and uh, Fred Crow. That, uh, that, um, that, that, that first appeared in the ACM Signum uh, publication in 1973. And that, again, was to get the community involved in this, uh, this effort. In 1975, I was involved in a project called uh, LAPAC. LAPAC was an effort. It's not, it, it, at this time, it wasn't a benchmark. It was an activity to really develop linear algebra software. And that software was designed to be uh, portable. It was designed to be efficient for doing certain kinds of matrix, matrix calculations. Um, about that time, vector computers were really coming onto the scene. So the Cray-1 was a machine that was appearing. 
Um, uh, and in common use were uh, machines like uh, the, the DEC VAX machine uh, with the Unix operating system. So we had a, we had a package that was going to do linear algebra. And we had vector machines that were, that were just appearing. And we had a set of routines to do vector operations in a way that allowed us to be very portable and hopefully would, would help in getting performance. Um, I read three papers about this time that really had a big impact in terms of um, a lot of the work that took place um, uh, in the LINPAC, LAPAC project and even further on, and especially for building Atlas. So there's a paper by Cleve Moeller. You may not know the name Cleve Moeller, but he's the guy who gave us uh, MATLAB. And uh, Cleve had a paper that appeared in uh, the CACM, which talked about uh, paging and the importance of addressing things in a certain way to get high, relatively high efficiency on the machines that were around then. At this point, we didn't have cache-based machines. Uh, paging was a mechanism used to effectively, um, um, uh, effectively use the memory system that was on these machines. The other paper that uh, had an impact on me was one by uh, David Pager. David Pager wrote a paper about um, how to speed up certain loops. And uh, basically, he introduced this notion of loop unrolling. Uh, so there was a loop there doing some operations, and he expressed that loop as, a, as an unrolled way of doing business. And the, um, the effect of that was to basically get about a 20% improvement in performance by doing that loop unrolling. That's the way he told the story. The other paper, the other paper that uh, I read that had an impact in terms of the work was uh, Don Knut's paper. It's a paper that looked at a whole series of Fortran programs that he had access to, and looking at how the compiler was operating with them, and how sometimes the compiler was doing good things or bad things, and how we could perhaps write the Fortran code so that the compiler would understand what to do in a very effective way. So those were three papers that uh, had what I would consider a big impact on, on the way I was thinking at the time. In 1979, um, the, um, the blahs were really published, and I had the opportunity to publish my first paper. So the first paper that appeared in a journal that bears my name is this paper about unrolling loops in Fortran. So Alan Hines and I worked together at Argonne National Lab, and it really used the ideas that Pager had talked about in terms of unrolling loops. So we took a simple loop, uh, unrolled that loop, and we did experiments on a wide range of machines and recognized that we were seeing a 20% 20, 20 to a factor of two improvement in overall performance by doing these simple uh, loop unrollings for these vector operations. That um, the blahs, the level one blahs, were finally published about this time, and Lawson, Hansen, and the group there recognized the work that was going on in terms of loop unrolling, and they actually used the code that, was, that we had developed in the implementations that appear in the Tom's uh, article, or uh, the Tom's algorithms that represent uh, these, these level one blahs operations. So vector operations, unrolling loops on scalar machines to get performance was thought to be a good, a good idea. However, um, un this unrolling technique was really a disaster on vector computers. The compiler had no way to re-roll the loops. So you have to understand that at this time, there was no unrolling flag that you can give the compiler. So that's another reason why you had to do these things in a rather uh, uh, manual fashion. So this was a disaster for vector machines, and we had to uh, think about ways of overcoming uh, that uh, situation. So Stan Eisenstadt at Yale and I uh, thought about that with the concept of vector machines, and we, um, we thought about unrolling loops to do vector matrix vector operations, but not unrolling the innermost loop, looked at unrolling the outermost loop of this matrix vector operation. And if you unroll the outermost loop, then you present to the compiler the vectors along with the operation that's to be done, in this case here, taking a scalar multiple of a vector, and now we have a series of vectors, and the compiler was smart enough to realize that that could be vectorized uh, using the hardware that was available on the machine. In 1984, there was a, there was a paper published which talked about um, the ways to refactor many of the uh, linear algebra algorithms by simply um, uh, expressing the algorithm with different loop indexes. So in this case here of a simple matrix multiply, expressing those three loops and interchanging 
um, the indices of it gave you quite different access patterns. And those access patterns, of course, had a tremendous impact in terms of uh, the performance uh, that we saw depending how the matrix was laid out. In Fortran, by column, there was a certain access pattern that was better than others, and it also minimized the amount, uh, certain accesses minimized the amount of, uh, uh, of data traffic through the memory of that system. Also at this time in 1984, there was an activity that was started to standardize on these things now we, we now refer to as level two blahs, or matrix vector operations. In the, uh, in the late, uh, late 80s, there was a whole um, idea about rewriting these algorithms to be more uh, aware of the architectures that were available at that time. At this time, we had, um, uh, we had processors that had cache-based systems. Uh, they, they were becoming in, in great, uh, in, in prevalent use. And we resulted to uh, blocked-based, uh, block partition algorithms to effectively expose uh, data that could be maintained in cache and get very high, high efficiency. And that's essentially what happened. And that, that resulted in us being able to express algorithms in terms of these things we refer to today as the level three blahs or matrix matrix operations. It led to a way of, again, refactoring the algorithms to expose these blocks and then uh, using the uh, expression that minimized the amount of data movement uh, through, the, through the memory hierarchy that gave high performance. Uh, later in the uh, late 90s, uh, all of those ideas were put together in, in the uh, LAPAC package using blocked algorithms to effectively drive the computation. And uh, the ScalaPAC uh, project was started to implement those things on a distributed memory uh, architecture. So up until this point, uh, performance was done really with uh, hand tuning. A lot of effort went into uh, writing code that would be efficient for a certain processor. That hand tuning, however, produced uh, code that was quite uh, fragile. Small changes in the code that was written by hand caused major changes in terms of the performance that we saw uh, in the end. And it was a great uh, human effort to generate that hand tuned code. And with new versions of processors coming out, it was hard really to keep uh, track of the processors and what was going to be a good implementation or not. It took a lot of effort to get that in place. So it's difficult really to predict uh, based on things how the compiler, the microarchitecture, and so on are going to be, uh, gonna be uh, affecting the outcome of that operations. So we had a couple of uh, clusters at the University of Tennessee. We had no optimized versions of the blahs. We were designing a package that needed those blahs in a rather critical way. And uh, we decided to come up with some issue, we decided to come up with some strategies that would help along that way. So a code generator was, uh, was conceived with a search space associated with it. And I have to say that uh, the work that preceded our Atlas work is actually a project that uh, my colleague Jim Demel at Berkeley uh, began called FEPAC. Uh, they, they published a tech memo in 1996 and then the publication actually appeared in 1997. It was an early attempt to automate this idea of improving the performance by generating code, seeing how it performed, and doing that over and over again until uh, you end up with the optimized uh, version. And that was offline performance tuning. Um, the Berkeley codes uh, looked at level two and level three blahs, and they had an initial release back in 1995. They actually submitted a paper to SC in 96, and that paper was rejected. So perhaps if it was accepted, I wouldn't be standing up here today. We would be hearing uh, from the Berkeley people in, in terms of the blahs, uh, in terms of their uh, auto-tuning operations. They, they resubmitted that paper after fixing, I guess, some of the criticisms to the ICS meeting, and that actually appeared as a publication in 1997. So that project had a tremendous impact on the work that we were doing in, in, uh, in Atlas. And I think Clint will refer to uh, some of the reasons why ours is different than, than what we had with uh, FEPAC. Uh, there was also activities uh, going on to do auto-tuning for FFTs. FFTW, of course, was, was the package uh, that the, the guys from MIT uh, put together, which uh, has a lot of the same uh, characteristics at a high level, uh, but of course is quite different in terms of the strategies and things that go on underneath it. Atlas, again, was published in, in 1990, uh, 1998. There was also activities, it was a hotbed, I, in some sense, for, for doing this auto-tuning. Uh, there was a work going on at uh, CMU 
Um, Marcus uh, Puschel was the guy responsible for doing a set of codes which again did auto-tuning for digital signal, uh, digital signal processing. And I think at this point, um, what I want to do is to turn it over to Clint, who will talk more about the details and the implementations that we had uh, for, uh, for that work in, in Atlas. So do I, can I have that? Yeah. So normally I uh, figure my voice will carry and I take off my mic, but I'm guessing that's not a good idea in this room. Um, okay, so, uh, yes. So uh, my name is Clint Bailey, as you've seen, and Jack has basically brought us up right until the, th the beginning of this uh, paper, the, the work that happened in, um, mid-1997, and now I'm going to describe a little bit about what made this paper a little bit different than the state of the art as we found it at that time. So Jack's already pointed out that actually it was FEPAC that, as far as we know, first introduced the idea of empirical auto-tuning for high-performance computing, right? Um, and so the question is, why is this paper uh, as influential as it is, since really FEPAC is kind of the ancestor of, I think, all these packages that do this sort of thing. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, uh, so I'm gonna go over four critical things that I think Atlas got, that Atlas kind of pioneered in this area. And the first of them is using a microkernel. And so, let's see. If I can show you, so the idea of a microkernel is instead of tuning, if you think about something like matrix multiply, you have in essence an almost infinite degrees of freedom in your tuning process. How do you narrow that search space so you can search it rapidly? And how do you handle it in a way that means you find the best results at the point in which you can distinguish them by the timing that you're doing? And it was this area where Atlas excelled, which allowed it to uh, become successful as it was. So um, now, so I would say the most important aspect that Atlas brought to the table was using a microkernel. And so let me just give you a, uh, an idea of a microkernel. So here I've shown a big matrix multiply and as I say, now we can do multiple levels of blocking on top of this. We can do all kinds of different optimizations. And some of those optimizations require you to write new code for every new machine, while some of those optimizations are easily changed because all you need to do is vary a parameter, right? So what Atlas did was split out uh, the part all of the parts that needed to be completely new code when you went to a new machine, that is hidden inside of a microkernel, a much simplified kernel that you can easily define and easily time because it's used only in certain contexts. And then you can tune the, you can afford to tune that microkernel completely. And then that is the only completely system dependent piece of code in the whole library. And then all the higher level codes, which are less performance centric, can simply be optimized by basically varying parameters. So an example of a high level optimization is multi-level blocking as an example, right? Uh, so at the bottom level then we had a microkernel. So this is showing a picture of that. If this is your big matrix multiply you're doing, a microkernel is only, it's not gonna do blocking, it's just gonna be a simple three loops, though it's gonna not be simple, but it's gonna be a three loop impl implementation of, of matrix multiply. And it's gonna be blocked for some level of the cache, right? And it's not blocked in the sense that there's blocking in it, it's blocked in the sense of what are the sizes of parameters you call the microkernel with, okay? Um, now, we called our kernel in this paper the uh, on-chip multiply because it was a microkernel, we didn't have the term microkernel back in those days, but it was a microkernel that assumed it didn't have to handle the blocking that was done by higher level code somewhere else, okay? And so on chip, it was it's still to this day incredibly important that when you go off the chip, your memory speed drops by orders of magnitude. This code 
is really doing computational optimization primarily, the microkernel is. Therefore, it needs things that are basically in on-chip uh, caches, okay? And so uh, that's what we talked about. So when we did publish this paper, the only on-chip cache was the L1, which is why we sometimes called this the L1 multiply. In modern terms, this is often the L2 or L3 cache. Um, in reality, these days, it's either the last level private cache or the last level cache that you fit your microkernel into. Um, and like I say, one of the big benefits of a microkernel is that you isolate all of the things that require you to actually change the code in the microkernel. So to give an example from Jack's talk, loop unrolling where it's done in the code and not asked for the compiler to do it, that's an example of the only way to do that is to change the code. And now the way we can change the code, uh, in this case, in other words, we can vary the microkernel, is we can write a code generator, and that code generator can be vastly simplified because it is a microkernel. It's a very simplified operation as opposed to uh, uh, the full operation you would like to support. And we later showed, by the way, I think everyone knows, that if you have this small gem microkernel, matrix multiply mi microkernel, you could b basically build the entire level three blahs out of it, which meant you could increase the performance of most of LAPAC with just, just one microkernel. And so this was, so the use of a microkernel was, was a big deal, and defining a microkernel that had all the desired uh, uh, architecture hiding plus uh, the generality to build everything you need, that was, I think, our most major contribution. That contribution is so big that uh, the, uh, Berk the, the group at UT Texas have been republishing it all, uh, calling it the Bliss Approach. So if you've heard of the Bliss Approach, it's really the Atlas 1997 approach. Um, okay. So, so that was the first big contribution that was different than what uh, the state of the art or what FIPAC was doing at the time. Uh, the next step I would say is uh, the industry in general up until this point had been very careless with the way it did timings. So you could pick up a paper from this era and see that dot product, a completely memory bound operation, a level one blahs, ran at the same speed as matrix multiply, which is of course means that that would not be true on any cache-based system ever produced ever in the history of man, right? But that's what people said, and that's part of the problem with some early work in empirical tuning. They were not careful in how they did the timings, and if you're not careful in normal uh, HPC research, you merely misrepresent your performance. If you're not careful in empirical tuning, you disoptimize the code rather than optimize the code. And this is why some of the early work did not always work when ran on anything but a very narrow set of, of machines. So I would estimate that of this initial paper, at least one third of the time that I spent working on it, uh, the, both research and you know, actually just development time, was in writing smarter timers. Timers that take into account primarily cache effects, but also the context in which the kernel is being called, okay? Now, having much better timers gave us a lot of benefit. Uh, our optimizations that we chose based on timings turned out to be real optimizations. We actually did improve the code rather than making it run slower. Um, but also, the number, and so the, if you read the paper, this original paper we wrote, we actually tell people the numbers you see here are all much lower than any numbers you've ever seen published on these operations. But here's the reason why, and I describe a little bit how, that, uh, uh, how the, these timers worked. But the difference was when practitioners in the real world, and there were lots of us that needed these blahs at the time, which is why Atlas was produced, the numbers I was reporting was the numbers they were getting. And in the past, what would happen is they would see these results that were based on primitive timers, and they would not get within two orders of magnitude of the, re of the actual reported results, and then they would just dismiss the whole project, even though the project was sound, for instance, in the feedback case, because they would think, well, they're, you know, they're, this is not something that really works, right? So that was another big thing about 
uh, this work that had not been done before is our stress on the right way to do timings. And we discussed a little bit about how to do that in this paper, though I didn't actually give all of the technical details until 2008 in an SP&E paper. Uh, but it was overviewed in this uh, first publication. And now after Atlas was produced, a whole bunch of researchers went around uh, writing optimization search algorithms, which are quite interesting to do. But what we showed is that even though it is in theory an infinite space with high dimension, you know, let's say seven or eight at the beginning, maybe increasing a little bit over time, uh, and some of those dimensions are theoretically infinite. Some of them are, can you, you can bound by architecture features, like the number of registers. Um, but we showed that if you, you, that you can actually adequately search this space to find a very optimal solution uh, if you just use a hierarchical search. And the main thing of when I mean hierarchical, what, what I mean is if you try to optimize everything at the same time, many effects cannot be seen until the more important or the bottlenecks have been eliminated. So like one of the mistakes that early packages made was they tried to do computational optimizations before they did blocking optimizations. And, until, and so that means you're running, if you're out of the cache, you're running maybe 100 times slower than you should, which means you cannot tell the difference between the best computational code and the worst. Okay, so part of what we did with our hierarchical simple search, basically a modified line search, is we, using our knowledge of the importance of these things, we search them in the order in which they make, in which they get rid of the uh, biggest order of magnitude bottlenecks, which allowed us to find all the different details one after another. Um, okay, and then uh, I would say the last big thing that differentiated this paper was that we showed results on essentially every architecture that we had access to. I, I looked back and I think we had something like 20 or 25 architectures surveyed. I mean, this was a 35 page conference paper. It's the longest conference paper I've ever produced. Um, but this was part of what we needed to do to convince people that this was a viable strategy and it was not just it works on one place where we've tried it. Right? Um, okay. So, how am I doing on time, Mike? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna skip this. This is a overview of how the uh, search actually works. I'll leave that for the Q&A if people are confused. Um, let me talk just very briefly about uh, some of the work we're doing now. Atlas is an ongoing project, and I got a career award to try to modernize it. I mean, I've had a pretty good run. The basic thing I wrote in 98 has been elaborated on, but I'm still using the same stuff almost 20 years later. But modern is no longer viable in the last, say, five years. And the real reason is because of uh, huge increases in scale. And by scale, I mean both number of cores and also parallel from SIMD vectorization. Those two together is how we've basically been using Moore's Law for the last 10 years. And Moore's Law has not stopped doubling performance if you include those, okay? Uh, you know, back when I wrote Atlas originally, there was no SIMD vectorization on these machines. And a high core count machine was four cores, right? And now what that meant was, for instance, in the 1998 version, all the timings were done in serial, and then I pasted some parallel stuff on the top. In the modern version, which is now in the developer release, 3.11, um, hasn't had a stable release of this yet, all the timings are instead done in parallel, even the serial library tuning. And the reason is in modern times, I assume if you're an HPC got person, if you're calling the serial interface to Atlas, it's because you are doing parallelization yourself. It's not because you're not using parallel cores. And therefore, when I tune it, I need to tune it for the bandwidth divided by the number of cores, not the, not the total memory bandwidth, which is what happens when you tune serial first. Um, the other big change is I used to have only one microkernel. Now I have a suite of them uh, because basically depending on the parallel scale you are using, you are going to need a lot of different block factors to be able to exploit all that parallelism. 
right? Now they're all the same type of microkernel. That it's not like I'm generate, not like I'm writing 500 generators, right? But I now have the ability to to be very flexible in what that uh, kernel does. Um, okay, and another thing we're doing in this same front is we're having. So that's all, you know, and then we've got some new data structure types over the original, which allow you to better exploit SIMD. Um, and then the final thing you've got to do, if you start thinking about the kind of scale that we're seeing now in the Phi series, as an example, um, a mutex is way too much overhead to use. So you need to do stuff that, you need to find ways to do synchronization and communication at the speed of hardware, which we do with, based on exploiting cache coherence protocols. Um, and so the student who is working with me on the parallelization uh, research is a very excellent student named Raki Bassan. Um, and our work in Atlas showed us that when the generation idea fails, it's almost always the native compiler, the back-end compiler, the thing that translates from C code, if you want to think of that, or Fortran, down to assembly. It, it does something bad and messes up your perfect microkernel. Uh, and so we've also got a project uh, that a student named Majid El Sujan uh, is working with me with called IFCO, which is our own iterative floating point kernel optimizer, a, a compiler specialized for HPC, which no other compiler really is. Um, and I should mention, if you are looking for an HPC person, these, these are two excellent students who are graduating this year. So talk to me. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, I'm out of time, right? Uh, so I'm gonna skip, uh, this is the description of IFCO, if people are interested, I can go into that in the Q&A. Um, and so I'll just put up this as my last slide. Uh, I've got some further information if you wanna find links about some of the stuff Jack and I have covered. And uh, in case there's a long pause in the Q&A, I've preloaded a couple of questions that uh, I can remember the answer to if anyone's interested. Um, and I guess, Turn it over to Mike. Thanks. Okay, now is your opportunity to uh, ask questions of Jack and Clint. Um, I, I personally really like this award because of the historical aspect of it and an opportunity to ask questions that are a bit retro retrospective in nature. So, you know, please uh, take some time to uh, think of a good question. Uh, and there's a mic on either aisle here on the sides. Uh, also, we do have some questions that were submitted online, so I'll, I'll uh, ask those on behalf of the people who submitted, but it'd be first good to get anybody coming up who has a question in person. So yes, don't be shy. Okay, there's one there. Please uh, use the microphone, if you will. I'm, I can repeat for you, yes. He's asking, uh, she, she's asking about the two. OK, questions. we have a request to uh, answer the two questions that you asked of yourself, Clint. So maybe I'll do the second one first because I find that might be useful for some of the students in here. Uh, I was a researcher with Jack around the time when Atlas, when I first started working on Atlas, and I was working on some incredibly boring projects or ones that had the smell of doom to me, like HPF. <laughs> and I was, I had to, went into Jack's office several times to pitch him on various ideas I'd had, unfunded, of course. I was, you know, I didn't have any grant money. so. How do you pitch that to somebody who does have some money, but not for this idea you have, right, which is new? Uh, so what happened to the first few times I went to Jack in the des my desperation to get off the project I was working on was I outlined some great idea I had, and Jack would say, well, you know, group A, B, and C are working on that. We're done with this meeting. <laughs> and it took me a little bit before I understood what he was telling me. You are not giving me any reason to believe that you are going to be better at this than people who are already looking at the problem. And so when, I, when the work I was doing pointed out to me that we needed something like Atlas, I did not go to Jack right away. I went and then I got a demo working showing that I could 
out-tune anything out there for a couple of machines with the basic ideas. And that's how I pitched Jack and said, look, I know that we don't have funding for this right here, but this will help these other four projects you do have funding for. And then Jack gave me the okay. And so that's, I don't know, I thought that might be of interest to, if you're a student uh, who who's thinks there's a more interesting project, or if you're a full-time researcher, if you're not experienced at that. And I think the same thing basically works when you talk about going to funding agencies. Show that if, if they don't know who you are, give them a reason to believe you have something that other people don't have, okay? Um, and then I would say on the why did we start Atlas and why not collaborate, let me, let me say why didn't we collaborate with Feedback? I was a very young researcher at this time and I basically, I tried to in my unique way. I sent mail to Jim Demmel who was leading the Feedback group and I said, hey Jim, you, you remember I'm the student who second guessed every decision you made in Scalapack? They said it was all crappy? Well, I would like to tell you how Feedback's crappy now. And oddly enough, Jim did not take me up on my offer to uh, help him out with uh, Feedback, which is why we produced Atlas. And now we produced Atlas because we were, this was the time when Beowulf first came out, clusters. And for the first time, hand tuning was not completely inadequate. It was completely inadequate. And the reason was, there wasn't just five big iron machines that mattered anymore that you could concentrate those people on. We had uh, clusters that either licensing wouldn't allow us to use them, the, the existing blahs in the ways we needed to, or no vendor blahs existed. And that was basically what forced us to develop. I mean, and of course, what we first hoped to do was feedback, but because of the early nature, it did not quite get us what we needed, which is what opened the door for Atlas. Yeah. Okay, we have uh, one question from the audience. Uh, as processor architectures become increasingly complex, do you think it is inevitable that Atlas-like packages will be required to extract the most performance for linear algebra kernels versus hand tuning? Um, so let me just make a comment here. Um, uh, so I would say that auto-tuning is, is something which is going to be critical as we, uh, as we continue uh, with the architecture complexity that we have. And as we move to more uh, parallelism, uh, it really needs to be embedded in the software that we design from scratch. That is, have the ability to do the auto-tuning. Now, Atlas and FEPAC and things like that, they do auto-tuning uh, before it's done once for an architecture and it freezes the code at that point. Uh, the kind of auto-tuning I think we'll need in the future is something which is much more dynamic that occurs during the execution that can adjust to uh, differences in terms of the number of cores, uh, the frequency that those cores are running at to avoid this issue of uh, jitter that uh, we're starting to see with different cores running at different frequencies. So all of that needs to be built into the uh, software when uh, the applicate when, when, when it's designed and also uh, uh, performed, the optimization performed dynamically as the algorithm is, uh, is evolving and running. So that's sort of the way I would uh, see it. Um, I would just add, I actually, uh, so I agree with what Jack said, but um, I don't think it's, it is, you do not need empirical tuning if your only goal is to say we're gonna support the most mainline architectures. The classical approach, if you combine microkernels with hand tuning, which is essentially what Bliss does, that's going to work fine if you only care about the top, you know, five big architectures at a time. Uh, where auto tuning is really, I think, uh, irreplaceable is when you say uh, this code is going to do decent on almost every machine that ever goes. It may not be perfect, but it's going to give you a good blas or a good computational kernel anywhere. Uh, we have one more question. Um, you've addressed this partly in your responses, but I'd like you to think more broadly, perhaps. Uh, there have been other auto-tuning software efforts in HPC, but few have been successful. Why has Atlas succeeded? Go ahead, it's yours. <laughs> so I would say other than the, I mean, these four critical things were, 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 the, were the most important, I would say. 
And the second thing I would say that, that has made it enduring is the fact that, that we were consumers of it ourselves. We ate our own dog food. And therefore, it was not just a toy project. You know, just like Scala Pack and LA Pack before it, it was a real tool to be used by computational scientists. And we were not simply publishing our quickest paper and doing the least work for that paper. We were trying to solve the problem and then document the research we did to solve the problem. And I think that's a difference that it's, it's hard to support that in academia. It was one of the great things about working at ICL with Jack is that we had a more broad view of trying to solve computational problems as the primary goal and CS research as the way we get to those goals. Yeah, let me just add to that. So it, it's not demoware, and that, that's really what Clint is saying. It's something that's intended to be used and uh, used not only by the developers of that library, but to a broader, a broader group. And the other thing I'll add is that all the software that we develop is, um, is uh, uh, freely available. It's, uh, it comes under a modified BSD license, so you can uh, take that software, you can embed it in your product, and uh, you can sell it as far as, I'm, as far as we're concerned. Uh, and I think that helps to promote uh, software that's re reasonably well written and documented and uh, effectively uh, solves a given problem. Yeah. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, I'm Tim Maddox. Um, I uh, work with the Department of Defense in the uh, High Performance Computing Modernization Office. Uh, I'm a pet contractor. The uh, question I've got is actually twofold. Um, does the emergence of having these scratch pad memories change how you do your auto tuning, or is that just yet another parameter you throw in? Because uh, that's something that the I think the general programmer doesn't want to deal with, but it gives you a lot of potential for uh, performance improvement. Um, are you talking about things like on the cell processor uh, scratch well, well, pad? Yeah, yeah the, the cell was early, but now like the the the. Night's Landing. I mean, mm, nice go ahead. Oh, why don't you, Jack? No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. So, I mean, I, I think that indeed those turn out to be another level of the memory hierarchy, which have to be solved essentially with explicit blocking, is, is the way I think, it, uh, I think of that. And you are right that it's hugely important. It's uh, in Atlas itself right now, we do it only with normal multi level blocking. So it's not yet. You know, I have not, uh, I have not got uh, access to Knight's Landing yet. <laughs> and, and the other question that's kind of related is, can auto-tuning solve some of the issues with the multiple uh, sw uh, swim lanes that we have uh, as far as the accelerator architectures and the, the lots of small cores? Um, can auto-tuning help us out of this mess? Um, uh, so, so I would say um, uh, things uh, in, in the context of a node which has a heterogeneous uh, behavior, uh, 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 underlying set of cores or processes, um, you know, we're looking towards uh, a, a runtime system that runs on the node, which basically tries to balance and does the effective dynamic auto-tuning. So the runtime system is running on a node. It has a pile of work that it has to do, and it makes decisions dynamically on how to farm out that work to the underlying cores. And then a strategy like, um, like Atlas has to optimize the performance on a given core is the thing that would be used from that standpoint. So as, as we see nodes evolving, which have uh, multiple GPUs, uh, uh, fat, fat cores and lightweight cores, I would envision um, a runtime system that could effectively um, uh, deal with that level of heterogeneity uh, dynamically and uh, underlying uh, the, the basic operations then would be uh, more like a optimized uh, a kernel routine that Atlas would produce. So just to extend what Jack is saying, um, think of it as empirical tuning all the way down but not all at once. So I agree with Jack when you wind up with very different processors with very different, or very different accelerators with very different characteristics. Your breast approach, approach is essentially a, a dynamic scheduler, in other words, the runtime. And then for each individual system, you do a tuning step like 
Atlas for CPUs or maybe Magma, if I remember the correct name, for GPUs that uh, the ICL group works on. And, you know, but, and, you know FFTs can, is also in there. But in other words, you, you specialize certain parts. You do like maybe mostly compile time optimization uh, uh, or empirical tuning. And then you do also another step over the top, which can be a mixture, but primarily dominated by runtime tuning, which is your dynamic scheduling. And then when you're talking about using very, very small cores, some of our research that Rakib Hassan has worked on, we've been trying to get on CPUs, speeding up, you know, we've always been able to use scale to speed up small, uh, large problems. But how do you use scale to speed up small problems? because everything's starting to look like a small problem with the scale we got now. And some of the work, uh, if you look at my webpage, you can find some work by Rakib Hassan where we, where we try to lower the overheads enough to really get uh, performance improvements in a way that even like MKL, well, they do now, but when we published it, they didn't get. Uh, so yeah. up with um, you know the question that was previously and also Jack said that now we want dynamic adaptive uh, auto tuning and as you recall the next generation software program I from NSF I announced in 98 uh, and before that at DARPA uh, it had these objectives people said this is raising the bar too high <laughs> and I'm glad to see <laughs> that we have made considerable progress and, and now we are in a sense talking about this idea so I appreciate very much because it's work uh, that the community did on this spy in the sky that was putting including the work of Jack and his students. Uh, so ba thank, thank you for all this success. The thing that we are looking now and DOD has an initiative called Autonomy self-healing systems, uh, dynamic adaptive runtime is raised in a, an, another level, not only achieving performance, but continually, in a sense, readapting the performance because of uh, things failing and, and, in a sense, recovery and so on. So how do you see these ideas having, in a sense, being extended and having impact on that or what we need to rethink in order to enable also now recovery, self-recovery, and so on. Well, so, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I can address all the things you, you brought up, but, um, uh, and thank you so much for the programs that you started both at uh, NSF and DARPA and continue with, uh, with the Air Force. That's, that's uh, good <laughs> things. Um, uh, but, but recovery from failure is going to be a big issue, I think. And, you know, up to now, we basically re relied on the hardware doing the recovery and uh, users would do checkpoints to maintain that. And we, I, I think we need to be thinking about how we can build the recovery into the algorithm itself and how it can transition past uh, failures at the, uh, at the task level, at the process level, uh, so that we can maintain uh, uh, the computation in the presence of those failures. And the failures I'm thinking of occur both because of uh, hard failures where you lose a process, but also soft failures where uh, you get the wrong answer. So bits get flipped somehow, and we have examples of machines where that, uh, that does happen. And uh, being able to trap or catch and then somehow recover from those uh, failures. You know, there, there are many, many ideas and many of them are, are, are in use and these are not uh, uh, new things. Uh, but I think it's important that we think about that and perhaps look towards embedding that into the algorithms as we move forward. So I'll just add to that. I mean, I think, not me, but when I was at Jack's group, they were doing some early work on that, on checkpoint recovery. Uh, but the thing I, I, and I, and I, to me, I think that runtime that Jack's talking about needs to do a lot of that. Once you get to the system level, when you're like one, running on one accelerator, it's usually too expensive to do. But an idea of a checkpointing at the accelerator level in a runtime is the, is the way I think to handle it in a way that's not, because it's a huge trade-off between being able to recover and the overhead of it, right? And if you think about when you're trying to do, like use all the cores of a Phi, you have to have very low overhead or you just can't do it, which means you can't afford the checkpoint. And, and if someone dies in the middle of that, because you're using low overhead, that means you can't even recover from someone not posting a message because you're using a context or something like that. So I think that you need a hierarchy 
And you need a, a way of looking at it where there's, it's strongly hierarchical, and then you're doing that kind of checkpointing at the right level of the hierarchy. I think that's the key to success. We have another question from the website. Uh, the microkernel approach is a neat abstraction you used for tuning. How transferable is that approach, and is it possible to use in other domains outside of linear algebra? Absolutely. There's nothing at all. I mean, I'm not certain of this, but I believe that's what Spiral and FFTW do a lot of. Now, they don't, it's not at all the same, but it's the same, it's a similar idea. Uh, the art of it is finding the right level of abstraction too high a level and your kernel is too complicated to tune well, too low a level and it's not flexible enough to do what you need, right? And if you're auto-tuning as opposed to hand-tuning, uh, that's writing a code generator is complicated, so you don't want an overly complicated kernel. So that's kind of the art part of it. But I, it works, I think, on any system uh, that empirical, tu that, that tuning can provide you with big benefit in, which is not all of them, unfortunately. <laughs> well, there is uh, one more question to ask uh, from the website. If there's anybody who has any other last questions, please step up, otherwise this will be the last one. Um, looking back, uh, what have you found to be most surprising about the Atlas effort? It's your project. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't think I would still be doing it as my primary work 20 years later. I guess maybe that, you know, the, the fact that I, it has succeeded to the degree that it has, and also that I've managed so far just barely to keep it funded for, for quite a bit of that time, uh, I guess that is probably the most surprising. Cause it, Doing this level of software work is not super compatible with an academic lifestyle, unfortunately. Uh, but I've managed to kind of make it work. So I guess that's maybe. Any other comments from you, Jack? Fine. No. All right, very good. Well, uh, let, let's thank our award winners one more time. Thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you for participating in this event to, event to celebrate uh, the efforts of Jack and Clint.